We begin as ever with the headlines and then it's something sporty and electric from Renault and something less sporty and less electrifying from Chevrolet. If you've never heard of James Blickenhaus, you're about to. And ditto Tata's Tigor. Plus the big 7 Series Beamer you'll almost certainly never buy. The UK government has been forced by a High Court decision to publish its plans for reducing air pollution. The result is a document that is weak and woolly, according to Client Earth, the lawyer group which has been pushing the issue through the legal process. It's titled as a consultation document and it makes lots of suggestions but almost no definite policies. Unsurprisingly, it focuses on diesel cars as the way to reduce pollution and even less of a shock, its primary suggestion is the introduction of congestion zone charging. Make diesel owners pay for following the government's advice to buy a diesel car. We are surprised by this, even though it ignores the mass of scientific evidence which shows that 75% of vehicular pollution comes not from cars, but from HGVs. And that includes the buses and trains, which politicians say they would prefer us to use for travelling around cities. Philippa Oldham, who's head of transport and manufacturing at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, told the BBC that cars are collectively much newer, five to ten years old, than buses, trains and lorries, which can last up to 20 years and more, and that the car fleet thus has mostly newer, more efficient technology under the bonnet. She also suggested that the issues extend beyond the nitrous oxide emissions of diesel engines and include particulates from brakes and tyres. If we banned diesel completely, she said there would be a 45% drop in nitrous oxide levels, but no significant reduction in particulate emissions. Other reports have blamed other sources entirely removed from vehicles the rise in popularity of wood-burning stoves as an apparently green alternative to turning on the oil or gas-fired boiler has led to wood smoke being responsible for as much as 10% of the smog clouds hanging over our cities. And they are the things responsible for the deadliest particulates of all. So small they can get through filters and face masks and into your lungs and maybe even through your lungs and into other organs of the body. But at every level of government, national, regional and local, politicians are busy demonising the owners of diesel cars with the purely cynical intention of raising money by taxing them in the name of good health. And finally, the bad news. Analysts looking at the continuing small slide in US car sales are predicting that the industry will end the year with 17.2 million vehicles sold compared to the record-breaking 17.5 of last year. But it's the next couple of years that will be harder, they say, with a predicted 16.6 million in 2018 declining to 15.2 million during 2019. As if our worries about the electric alternatives to diesel cars weren't already keeping us awake at nights, here comes Zoe to add to our problems with 460 horsepower and the zingy good looks and a clear message that once again, powertrain really matters. Hybrids and Aleckis are a blind alley we've been saying so for years and we see no reason to change our minds about that now. But that doesn't make little Zoe into a bad car. 250 miles, Renault says, for the range of regular Zoe, which means you can expect to get back home after visiting a place 125 miles away with reasonable confidence. Although he wouldn't want to be you if your return journey was motorway almost to your very doorstep. And that's the floor 
with all electric cars. Even if you can find a place to plug it in, it takes ages to replace its fuel reserves compared to minutes with a combustion car. Impractical is still a good word to describe it, and though governments hope car makers can convince buyers that its disadvantages are outweighed by its planet-saving characteristics, we all know that's a load of baloney, and it's still an impractical heavyweight that's over-dependent on long-term recharging. 465 horsepower, though, in this sporty concept, 60 in three seconds, thanks to the linear delivery of the Lecky motors, and that means it could be a whole heap of fun to drive, although perhaps not for very long. Any electrically-minded chap will tell you that as you ramp up the power output from the battery pack, you cut down on the range, which makes it a track day car only, if it was ever built. And it's not going to be, so we're told. But wouldn't it be nice if regular Zoe had one of those mode settings that go from shopping through to sporty and on to racy, and suddenly let loose megawatts of power to the wheels? What do you think that says? A seat. Yes. Seats five. Seats for five. Oh, oh and ten. ten. Woo! So ten like airbags. Five. Ten airbags. Okay. Ten airbags. This is a very safe wow. car. Wow, that is a safe car. American buyers have long equated the size of a car with its safety quotient. The bigger it is, the less likely it will be to sustain major damage in a road collision, and the less likely its owners are to be hurt in that instance. There are a lot of big lorries on US roads and they can be quite intimidating, especially if you're in a small car looking up at them. So it's easy to see how you'd prefer something rather larger, even though small cars are statistically no more dangerous convincing family buyers they can entrust their precious cargoes to a small cut like cruise is never going to be easy any more than it is convincing them that small cars can not only accommodate the trappings and luxuries that you traditionally find on the larger models but that it can live with them fit them in without making you feel they've been fitted in European drivers are brought up on this sort of stuff. Cruise sits on the Astra platform and is the size equivalent to Focus and Golf and so on. But when it was available in the UK, magazine reviewers always seem to be comparing it to Elantra or i30 or, on a good day, Mazda 3, as if there was some kind of subclass into which most small cars could be placed the not quite good enough to beat a golf category for buyers on a budget. But this is a Chevrolet, the only car company that could legitimately describe itself as the heartbeat of America. And so back in the USA, this has to be mainstream, has to be good enough, well equipped enough and plush enough to be in the top category of cars bidding for your bucks. Which is a quite different set of nameplates over there. Toyota and Honda rule the roost pretty much. Nobody had much time for Volkswagens and that was before Dieselgate. And Audi very much is in a different price bracket. And of course there's the rest of the world to consider as well. Although GM has abandoned Europe now, it still has markets pretty much everywhere else. And in a lot of those, cruise is perfectly suited to local tastes. Three million have been sold worldwide by 2014, with China, the biggest market, 30% larger than the cumulative volume in the USA, which means it makes perfect sense to have a particular Chinese version, while South Africa has the 10th biggest share of the world market, in which Europe 
wasn't even mentioned. Despite the recently introduced second generation, US sales fell last year, partly because car sales in general are in decline as part of a worldwide trend. The drop in cruise sales in China corresponds almost exactly to that in the USA and to an overall downward slide for all Chevrolet models in China. So the picture is bleak and the future direction of the market unclear. US car makers have caught this cold before. The boom years only need a few months of rising fuel prices to see the bubble burst and the constant need for growth that dictates a growing dependence on subprime loans makes it unusually susceptible to minor outside influences. So cars like Cruise, which is a fine car in its market, are a vital part of the mix for GM and for Chevrolet, and may become even more so. And next up it's BMW, Tata and Glickenhouse, oh yes. We have XS and XL in the car sizes ahead, but first... There isn't time to do this story justice in a whole episode of Auto Mundial, never mind the next couple of minutes. But if you have a moment and feel like typing the words Glickenhaus and Nürburgring into Google, you will surely be able to find the details of a tale that explains why racers like racing and why there is nothing like it for giving David the opportunity to boot Goliath up the backside. Or, in this case, giving New York filmmaker and race enthusiast James Glickenhaus the opportunity to do so. In the true spirit of the Bentley boys, Scuderia Glickenhaus built a road car for the racetrack something which he says other makers, including his idols at Maranello, no longer do. Their exotic hybrids are track day specials, neither designed for nor capable of entering an FIA sanctioned race event, and certainly unlikely to survive 24 hours of non-stop battering around the Nordschleife. This heretical utterance is backed up by deeds and the Glickenhaus team's success at the ring a couple of years ago was one of the most popular results in the pit lane at the time, although the stand in Geneva this year was a remarkably low-key affair. You can still buy the Racepec version with a Hewlin gearbox and a full aero kit, but most people are more likely to want the Stradale model with less fangs all round and a comfy leather interior. Underneath, it's still the same car that tamed the ring though. Perversely though, the road going version has a bigger engine, 4.4 instead of 3.9. All the better to accommodate the emissions legislation with which road cars must comply, but race cars need not. In order to save millions on crash testing, Stradale comes with a kit you build yourself, rather like Lotus used to do back in the day, though that was a means of avoiding tax and keeping the price down. It's not really a pretty car, this, but it's not meant to be. Form follows function and all of that, and anyone who sees it from any angle will know exactly what that function is meant to be. If the Mafia had been a German thing instead of an Italian one, then this would surely be their staff car. The S-Class is altogether too posh for the job, but this has the right air of relentless competence and determination. You've got something that needs taking care of, the big Beamer is what you want. Of course, the very idea of such a staff car dictates the existence of a driver, and that in turn mandates supreme rear seat accommodations. 
most people agree that there are better chauffeur cars out there and some might even say that because the 7 Series is such a well-sorted car to drive, it's almost better to drive yourself places than be driven there. BMW dashboards and driving seats are among the very best, possibly the best ergonomically, though we find such unrelenting precision just a touch too clinical. Functionally, there's nothing wrong here though, nothing to complain about at all. We have a bit of a thing about wooden cars, so it would be a delete option for our own 7 Series, but that's just a personal thing and it's only a fraction of what's going on in here. We'd want the long wheelbase version if we were planning on being driven a lot of places, as well as somebody up front who didn't find all this gesture control a trifle unnerving, though it's conceivably an improvement over shouting at the dashboard trying to make voice control work. We are probably just a little bit old-fashioned in that respect. I doubt this, this and the many other new methods of interfacing with your car, whether as a passenger or as a driver, will become not just accepted, but routine. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes to filter down to the 1 Series, though, even a top-of-the-range 1 Series. As motorists, there's a lot more trickery. We accept a lot more readily, though, mostly because it, it is, for the most part, invisible to us, completely transparent in use. Although we've heard of cars which needed their sat-nav updating in order to make the lights work properly because they relied on it to know which way to turn at any given moment, we have never heard of one which selects the wrong gear because it had lost its GPS signal. But gearboxes that know where they are have become part of the background clutter of cleverness as well. Deciding whether to go for an upshift based on the known gradient of the road ahead would have sounded like black magic 25 years ago when there was no GPS, never mind electronic gearboxes. But it's just one more way in which technology improves the driving and the being driven experience. And it always starts with the top of the range models like this one. Now, we saw the D on the back of this car and decided not to mention it. If you've got 60 plus thousand pounds to spend on the 7 Series of your choice, you probably won't be worrying about the fuel bills, we suspect. And you may not even bother to look and see that its fuel economy is A plus compared to its rivals, whichever power plant you opt for. And you already know it's on the road dynamics, making a more rewarding car to drive than be driven in. But we're sticking with our first impression. Overall, this is a class piece of work, but not quite as classy as the S. This is fast, effective, functional, and the S is a lot plushier looking inside and out. Tigor, or we guess you should pronounce it and just ignore the spelling. It's Tata's latest addition to its range and primarily aimed at India, of course, where it's going to be one of the cheapest cars around. Seven and a half thousand dollars for openers, more if you're feeling flush. And that puts it below comparable cars from Maruti, from Volkswagen, from Honda and Ford, as well as a load of other well-known brands. And there's a case to be made for its unusual looks. Tata calls it a style back and you will doubtless have your own opinions about that. Petrol or diesel seems to be the biggest decision buyers face. Both 1.3 cylinders, which are available in the existing Tiago, which is slightly bigger and slightly more expensive. It's easy to think that at this price point, all cars are much of a muchness but every extra feature assumes comparatively more importance. The presence of a rear seat armrest with cup holders 
can be quite significant when the rival you're considering doesn't have that luxury. But to be fair, the Tigor does have quite a bit going on up front with a new look dashboard and an infotainment screen, plus Bluetooth connectivity and all sorts. And you can have Harman audio if you're splashing out. Car sales in India have trebled in the past 10 years, almost three and a half million units. But its worldwide reach gave Tata over five million sales last year. Clearly, India's biggest car maker is doing something right, and doubtless Tigor will help grow the numbers. And from one small Tata to another, we'll reserve that treat for next week though, with details of Nexon, the baby SUV without which no maker of size and substance can consider its range to be complete. India will be a big market one day, and Tata will be a big part of it. Now then, 65 years ago, as Corvette was being prepared for launch, GM staff kept every scrap of paper and photographed almost everything that happened, almost as if someone knew that their new model was already on the brink of greatness and would one day be an icon. We saw the Subaru XV concept a while back in blue, and now here's the production version as unveiled in Geneva in orange. Subaru seems to be going from success to success right now, and this will probably become another one.